Today's podcast is my first interview with Brian Kite that I did in the first months of the podcast at the end of 2016. And this one is just full of great information. I was excited to listen to it again and remember how good it was in, in terms of what BK delivered here. The information here really applies to anybody who's a coach. I don't care what level you're at. I don't care what position you hold. This is about being a leader and building a culture, owning the 20 square feet of your culture, as BK likes to call it, and a ton of takeaways from this one. So enjoy. Welcome to the Coaching Coordinator Podcast. Our guest today is Focus 3 CEO, Brian Kite. In addition to his work with Corporate America and Education, Brian also works with Power 5 football teams and teams in the NFL. Most of you are probably familiar with him for his work with the Ohio State Buckeyes, which Urban Meyer chronicled in his book, Above the Line. Today, Brian shares his thoughts on leadership, building culture, and his equation E plus R equals O. Brian, welcome to the Coaching Coordinator Show. Glad to be here, Keith. Thanks for having me on. Brian, uh, give our listeners who aren't familiar with you, you uh, a little bit of your background and uh, kind of fill in the blanks for us. Yeah, so grew up in Southern California, San Diego and Los Angeles. When I turned 18, I did what every Southern California young man dreams of doing. I, I moved out to the Midwest and I, uh, I played college football at Worcester, D3 school. I was... Uh, uh, at the time, the uh, the big time programs were not recruiting moderately quick five foot eight white dudes. Uh, they still aren't. And uh, but I wanted to play. And I wanted to to be around football in a place that it mattered. California was great for beaches and all the other things, but it was probably thirty or fortieth thing down on the list to do was you know college football on a Saturday and living and breathing it every day. Uh, Ohio was a place where I could be indoctrinated into a football culture and keep that going. So played it at, at Worcester and I geared my last two years of study at Worcester around a very simple, but turns out pretty profound and powerful notion and, and relevant for the audience. It says here, here's what my last two years of studies at Worcester were about who is coaching the coaches. I, I, I literally wrote two thesis papers on that singular topic who is coaching the coaches. And what I found out was that the most undercoached profession in America was coaches, not unique to just football, but every sport. So I had two rules at the time. I wasn't going to work with my dad and I wasn't going to work in business here 12, 13 years later. Neither one of those actually held true. <laughs> I wanted to coach coaches. That's what I wanted to do from the very beginning. And so right after I graduated college, I, I took uh, everything that I thought that I saw to improve athletics, specifically football, because that was my sport, the mental side of the game for athletes, the culture side of the game for teams, and then the trust building and, and ability to coach hard, but coach and get things out of people for coaches, gaps that I saw. And I tried to go bring that out to coaches, and I was rejected by every coach I talked to, every professional, every college, every high school coach that I spoke to uh, across the board, regardless of you know success or quality of the coach, just no, nobody wanted it. So that was back in, in um, 2005. And so I worked in business. I, I, I did work with my dad who founded our company 30 years ago. And, uh, and I took over as CEO uh, a handful of years ago, but I started working with him. And it's interesting to note, I, I think I talk about this on a couple of videos, but it's interesting to, interesting to note that business and sports are almost exactly the inverse. Football is practice, 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 very small window that is game day and playing. Business, it's exactly the opposite. It's very little time to practice, and then you show up and it's game day every single day. You know, for those of those of your audience that are teachers, you know, your teaching job, it's game day every single day. You're constantly waking up and you have to be on point. So the 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 simple version is that that my dream and my ultimate desire all along was to help athletics build leadership, culture, and behavior. But for the first 10 years of my career, I went out and worked with Fortune 500 organizations, banks, hospitals, manufacturing firms, the government, and worked at the highest levels all over the world, Africa, India, South America, Europe, all over, obviously, the United States, working with the top organizations on the planet to help them install uh, exceptional leadership culture and behavior systems. And then a handful of years ago, we happened to meet Coach Meyer and he found out what we did, brought us into the program. There was a great fit there. And sort of a decade after I wanted to, we went all in on athletics. Well, Brian, you know, one of the things that, that you guys obviously promote and work with and 
help people build is the culture. And as a college recruiter, I'll, I'll go around to all kinds of different schools, some who are having success, some who aren't. But I would say the the one common factor, whether their locker room and weight room are beautiful facilities or, uh, you know, in need of a, of a facelift, the one thing you'll see in all of them are some great words, some great quotes, some motivational things all over the wall. <laughs> and it's like the common denominator. You would think all of them are, are doing things the right way. Um, but ultimately, some of those places are really missing the boat. And, and while they have those ideas in mind, those don't translate. What is it that they're missing? Where to start? Number one, I'm, I'm with you on the posters. You know, by, by, by all means, have good posters. But, but here's a starting point. And, and there's, there's, I mean, there, look, there's a thousand different ways to get culture wrong. There's a bunch of ways to get it right. Uh, but let's start with just a handful of core tenets. The, the first and most important is what is culture? I mean, Literally, right. what is it? I, I we started this. Right? So, so I still work with. You know, we we have we work with NFL football teams. Mm-hmm. We work with the league. We work with the the top college football programs in America, national championship coaches. We work with high schools all over the place. We work with, I work with fortune 100 organizations. And I, I get in front of these rooms and I get in front of coaches and I, you know, we have these conversations and people talk about culture and I say, okay, what is it? And I think, and you know, we, it's, it's your beliefs and your behavior. And I know you guys add some more to that as, as well. Yeah. But you hear, here's the thing, you, you, if, if, if your entire audience was live on this call right now and we said, what is culture? And you took, you took one program and you had 10 coaches from one program, five coaches from one program listening and said, what is culture? The most likely thing is you would get five different answers. Yeah, All I of agree. them are probably pretty good, but mm-hmm. you get five different answers. And the same thing would happen on an executive board, by the way. Same thing would happen you know, with, uh, with the management team and the board at a, uh, at a hospital. Because this, this word culture has been hijacked to the your culture is the quality of your facilities. The culture is, you know, like you mentioned, the posters on the wall. Culture is, you know, in, in the in the academic environment, right? The culture is casual Fridays or, you know, we have ping pong tables in our hallway. None of that stuff's culture. Culture is three things. Culture is what you believe. It is how you behave. And it is the experience that you deliver and the experience you get from the program. So it's just three things. But it's these, it's, it's three things in actuality, not what they are on the poster. It's what you actually believe, what you actually behave, how you actually behave, and the experience that it's actually like to work inside a program and to be an athlete in the program. And I'll give you a very real example. So one of the easiest examples is a coach says, in every sport, be mentally tough. And there's, there's, there's very few coaches who don't really drill that and hammer that. And they say, be mentally tough. Another big word shows up is be disciplined. And then what you'll see on a Friday night is you'll see a call go against the team. And let's say it's an objectively bad call. And this is what's, what's great about our, our TV environment now and, and the professional and the collegiate ranks is, you know, they have, they have videos on coaches all the time. So what's the typical response by a coach on the sideline when a call doesn't go his way? Most especially of those guys don't. Poor, especially as a poor call. Most of those guys are going to react. They're going to yeah. be demonstrative demonstrative and uh you usually though sometimes you you can't actually hear what they're saying uh you could tell that it's not very nice (laughs) yeah so is it the model of discipline no that's not is it is it the model of mental toughness no is is that and and look we're coaches too so you know for, for for everybody to know um we could we could spend a bunch of time here and 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 uh you know we could kind of ease into it but I think we're all grownups here, right? So, so let's do some coaching and let's, let's do some serious self-awareness. Are the coaches surprised? Are you surprised that there was a bad call in a football game? Have you ever played a football game where you agreed with every call and the ref didn't do something questionable? And are you not prepared emotionally or mentally on how you're going to handle the situation that is guaranteed to come up in every single football game you ever coach in your life? And when you preach discipline and mental toughness to your players and then This predictable moment shows up on the sideline and you aren't mentally tough. You lack discipline in behavior and you deliver that experience to your players. It forces the players to have to invest emotional energy into deciding, hey, what am I going to do? And what it does is it sets a culture. It, It drives a certain belief into the program, not written down, not on a poster, but a player believes all of a sudden Oh, and and the worst part about it is we don't know what that is. So if you tie these two things together, or these three things, I should say, what I believe drives how I actually behave. How I behave drives the actual experience that I get. And now reverse engineer it. 
the experience you deliver as a coach is going to shape the behavior of the athlete because the experience you deliver is going to tell that athlete what you really believe, independent from your poster. And that's the second half of culture that is relevant. One of the things that when we get when we get into a program, one of the first things we sit down with coaches and with athletes, but first with the coaching staff, is we say, what does the, you know, the phrase that comes up in culture a lot and with programs is here's our core values and a bunch of different terms for it, but core values is the most common. We have core right. values. And so the word core means heart. So the word core is actually Latin for heart. It's not center, it's not important, it's literally heart. So a core value is a value that is at the heart of your program. If you ask an athlete to buy in to the core value, what are you asking that athlete to do? You're asking the athlete to put that value on his heart. Well, there is a profound difference between a poster value and a core value. Poster values are conceptual. Core values are not. I will, I will compromise a concept in a moment of truth or when I'm stressed or when I'm tired or when I'm pushed, I'll, I'll, I will compromise the concept. It'll fade from my mind. But something that's core, something that's literally on my heart, that I will not compromise. And it takes a lot of work to take something off of the poster and get it into the heart of a 15, 16, 18, 20-year-old. That, that is very serious work, and it is far more complex and challenging to do than installing a cover two or teaching a three technique. Far more complex. And we don't invest the time to figure out how to do that. That definitely is, uh, and you say the word invest. And I want you to, you know, all of us, you know, listeners as well, think about what's the first thing you do when you take over a program. You know, uh, a coach is usually asking for some kind of a budget. And we're going to invest in the weight room. We're going to in, invest in new field equipment. We're going to get the best technology. And they have all those things at their fingertips and then the one thing that actually doesn't cost anything monetarily is the culture, but sometimes that's the last thing that's invested in. That you know, you make the mistake of we're doing all these new things. We're we're going to give you a new scheme that you guys weren't using before. We're going to put you in a a different offense or a different defense. What is it that coaches should do? You know, right from the beginning to start to establish that? So the first thing is you got to understand what the role and what the purpose of culture is. So before it's even anything tactical, we come from a very definitive place in, in culture. And this is across the board for all of our business clients. It's the exact same way. But culture has a purpose. And culture, there's part of how culture is commonly understood that is not culture's purpose. And I'll start there. Culture does not exist to make people feel good. That's not the purpose of culture. It can be a byproduct but that's not the reason to focus on culture. The reason we focus on culture and why culture exists is to drive the behaviors called for by your strategy. It's to drive the behaviors called for in your off-season program. The off-season program is written as you want it to be you know, run and as you want it to be done in terms of the effort and the intensity and the lifts and the runs you want guys to do. The X's and O's and the game plan and the the assignment, the technique, the location, the adjustments, you game plan those things. You know, you guys game plan those things to the nth degree, but is that what you execute? Do you execute exactly as the game plan is laid out? No, there's always a variable. And what's the, what's the variable? How aligned is the individual player and how aligned is the entire team around the game plan and the techniques and the assignments that we've actually laid out? And that's where culture comes to play. Strategy determines what you want to do. Culture will always determine how well you do it. And so I think people get caught up in culture of, oh, this is about making people feel good. False. I played football. There's a gigantic majority of football that does not feel good. And the things required for success require you to do a lot of stuff that doesn't feel good. So if your culture does not get people through those moments, then you don't have a culture that is going to allow you to execute your strategy, and it doesn't matter how you game plan. So that's number one is, is you got to mentally know why culture. Number two is you have to have a system for culture. You have to have a system. You know, this is the coach and coordinator podcast. Yeah. And, and so, you, you know, I, and, I, and I've listened and I, and I listen to who's on there. And I, there's these, you know, I, I hear the guys that, that you have on, right? You have, you have offensive coordinators, defensive coordinators. Uh, uh, you, have, you have defensive backs coaches. Those are my guys. You have, you have quarterback uh, uh, specialists and they are they're specialists at teaching what? They teach the, the system for playing quarterback in elite level, the system for running a cover two press, the system for running spread with uh, you know a, a power base. What's your system for culture? 
you would never run a football program without a system for offense, a system for defense, and a system for special teams. And yet we will run programs without a system for culture. We'll piece it together. We'll, we will we will take whatever time we have left over, and we will scan YouTube. We'll listen to a handful of podcasts. We'll buy a best-selling book, and then we will cobble together a lot of quotes. And one of the first things you, you talked about, Urban. One of the first things that hooked Urban from the very beginning, and, and he makes this uh, exceptionally clear in in all of the interviews that he does, and, and even in the book uh, Above the Line that that came out a, a year or two ago, that that I know a lot of people who listen are have read and 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 walk through, which is which is just such a tremendous resource. We were so excited how well it's done. But one of the first things that hooked Urban was early in the process, I, I, I sat down and I said, basically, I said the same thing that, that I just told you. I, I, I talked about this system piece. And he stepped back and he said, whoa, you know, all this time, and by this time he'd won two national championships. He said, all this time, I, I, I'm trying to focus on leadership and I never had a system. And he said, what Focus 3 gave me, what you guys gave me, is you gave me a better system. And, and he said, I, I don't know how much new I learned in leadership. Yes, yeah, some stuff. But the most valuable thing was you put a system to what I already believed and wanted to do anyway that I didn't have before, and it unlocked all the leadership stuff that I wanted to do. And I said, yeah, and I said, and I told him, and this ended up getting in the book, I said, yeah, because average coaches use quotes. Yep. Good coaches have plans, but elite coaches, they use systems. So that's the second piece. Is the first piece is know what culture is and why it exists. Otherwise, you'll let it go, right? I know why we play offense. I, I, know, I know why leverage wins on the line of scrimmage. I know why I keep an outside shade. I, I know why. But why do we do culture? Not to feel good, not for the fuzzy stuff. We do it because if you need to execute a certain task, you have to have the internal qualities that make you execute it up to our standard. That's a culture issue, not strategy. Number two is you have to have an elite system. You've got to have a system. You cannot cobble it together. And that might be the thing I want coaches listening to really consider the heaviest, you know, of out of today is what is your system for leadership skill? What is your system for culture skill? And then what is your, your system for behavioral skill, mental toughness, communication, trust, clarity, um, decisions under pressure. There's a lot of really good providers for those things. You know, obviously we, we, we believe in our tools and we believe in what we do. There, there's a lot of other, you know, good guys out there. Jeff, you had, you had uh, Jeff Jansen on, on podcast that does a great job of leadership stuff, a tremendous job, but pick a system and, and commit to a system just like you would for every other part of your program. Here's something that'd be interesting. And, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll try this out. I, I'm going to, I'm going to ask you a couple questions sure. and I want the coaches listening. I want you guys to think, and I want you guys to answer the questions as well. And, you know, maybe you, if you play this podcast back, play this with your colleagues or other coaches who maybe haven't heard this and have them answer it as you go and see if this squares with other coaches. So let's take, let's take two skill sets. Okay. Let's take job skills, in this case, coaching skills, and behavior skills. Let's put those two things together. And let's, let's operate under this premise that behavior skills drive coaching skills. A coaching skill is everything you know about your side of the ball, right? Offense, defense, and everything about the sports-specific stuff. Mm-hmm. And then behavior skills are the skills that drive success everywhere, things like discipline, patience, resilience, courage, mental toughness, self-awareness, the ability to accept feedback, how you learn, all those things, right? So here's a great question. There's a handful of questions. Which skill set do most coaches get hired for? Coaching skills or behavior skills? They get hired for coaching skills. Which skill set do most coaches get fired for? They get fired for behavior skills. Isn't that interesting? Yes. Which of those two skill sets is easier to teach to a coach? The coaching skills or the behavior skills? I think the coaching skills are. It's, X's, it's a X's little bit another. more knowledge based and right. It's it, it's a, it's the science part of it, right? It's yeah, it's right. done yeah. exactly this way. And and, and and you're and you're a coach yourself. Which of those two skill sets cause more issues for you as a coach, both with staff as well as with your athletes? And do you spend more time having to invest time, attention, and energy into the coaching side, the coaching skills, and the technical side? Or the behavioral side? You you spend more time on the behavioral side, especially on those teams that aren't doing as well. Uh, in fact, I, I remember a co- coach at a clinic saying, you know, the, the great teams 
you're going to spend 90% of your time on football and 10% of your time on behaviors and and the very poor teams, it's it's going to be opposite. But you could probably look at those teams and say, well, what's the culture you developed as well? Yeah, what was the what was the pre-existing? So just look at that. And I got two more questions, but just look at those four. The, the trends: coaches tend to get hired for job skills, but fired for behavior skills. The job skills are actually easier to teach than the behavior skills, but the behavior skills end up dominating our time, and where we end up investing a lot of the stress and the uncertainty is on are you know were you clear do you understand are you tough enough will you learn is this player going to mature in time it's all the non-technical side of the game that ends up consuming so much of our head and then here's the here are the two kickers and i'll ask one for the industry and then i'll just ask one for you both you keith and then and then you listening in the in the in the industry across and then just would talk to football coaches right now to this point in most coaches careers where have they spent more time efforts attention and rigor in studying understanding and practicing with thorough detail the job skill coaching side or the behavior skill side i would say it depends on the point of the coach in his career i could say in in these hundred or so interviews i've recorded when we've talked about this one of the the mistakes they talk about as a young coach they focus so much on scheme and not enough on the behavioral side of it. Where coaches Damn. now, they, they want to go to clinics and they said the, they really, you know, they need to find the guys who talk more about the culture and more about those things. Those are the guys yeah. they're interested in now. So I think yeah. it really is yeah. something you grow into as a coach. Yeah, and, 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 that's, and that's exactly what we hear and this is exactly what, what, what happens is, you know, you look at the trends and there are so, there's so much time and detail and energy. And then, like you said, especially young and early, and, it's, and it, it, it goes into the X's and O's and, the, and the, the technique and the strategy side of the game. And then we underinvest on the other side. And then that's just the last question is just individually, you know, at this point in your career, you, you who's listening right now, what are you giving more of your attention to in a more thorough manner? What do you understand deeper defensive line play or culture? What, what, what do you have a more rigorous approach to your, you know, wide receiver splits and passing game tree or exactly how trust is built and what your system for doing it inside your program is. Which one are you studying harder and deeper right now? And that's a rhetorical question, but it's, it's one worth spending time and thinking to yourself on because we see the same pattern developing and over and over. Your coaching skills will never go any further than your behavior skills. And your strategy will never go any further than your culture. Unfortunately, we just tend to underinvest on this other stuff and we don't spend the time. So those are just really relevant things to think of in that and you can pick up the coaching stuff straight away. Uh, you want your you want your X's nose to get unleashed. Go build a culture that unleashes them. Brian, we we obviously as coaches understand if I were to to, to even give a, a rookie coach the task of okay, I want you to put together our offensive system. Um, he's going to go out and he's going to find you know his run game plays. He's going to find his passing game plays. He's going to go into de- some detail about each of those positions and, and what they need to do within there and their assignments. But where where does a coach start in building a culture system and what things yeah. does he need to include in that culture system yeah the good news about a, about a a culture system is that every single thing that happens inside of a program builds culture so you simply have to build into the standards by which everything is going to be done but we, we break a culture system down into we and we call it a culture playbook interestingly enough we call that with our business clients as well it just it just happens to fit i think for football coaches particularly well is you have a you have a playbook for offense and defense so you might as well have a playbook for culture. Literally a, a physical playbook I can hold in my hand that shows me what the culture is and how I live it in my inside my 20 square feet of the program. And our playbook is, uh, we, we break our playbooks down into three components. We break our, our culture playbook down into a declaration of purpose, a statement of purpose for the program about what our culture, why our culture matters, or I should say what culture is and why it matters to our program. And, you know, at the, at the, collegiate level, that's something that's great for owning it within the program at the high school level. It's even something that is great for passing along to parents with all the challenges that come with parents, um, of which there's you know a whole myriad. Being able to put into the hands of parents something that's a clear statement of what your program is, how it's built, and what the culture is, gets the parents to help you build that culture. 
And if they have a better playbook, they can help you build it in addition to your staff and your athletes. So the first component is a declaration or a statement of purpose about what culture is and why it matters to our program. The second piece is the backbone uh, of your culture playbook. It's a document we call the BBO. It stands for Beliefs, Behaviors, Outcomes. And what it is is it's simply a roadmap for what we believe, the behaviors that show that belief in action, and then the outcomes that will happen in our program if we engage in those behaviors. And what that does is it teaches athletes as well as coaches, the staff, as well as the parents, that outcomes are dependent on the quality of the behavior, and the quality of the behavior is dependent on the depth of the belief. And you just do cause and effect. Belief, behavior, outcome. This is what we believe. These are the behaviors that will show me you really believe that. And then these are the outcomes that will take place in our program if we actually behave that way. There should be no confusion and no uncertainty about what those things are. And generally speaking, we encourage programs to build uh, a, uh, a BBO document that has between three to five beliefs. I will say never more than that because you can't execute more, let alone remember. I think we can our, these culture statements can get very bloated, but we are firm believers in this. Let me watch your behavior and it'll tell me what you really believe. Just, just let me watch your behavior and it'll show me what you believe. So what we really drill to in culture is culture, the center of gravity in culture is behavior. Now you got to get the belief to drive it, but the center of gravity is in behavior. And you know, for those that haven't heard it, there's the old adage, you know, what comes first, the belief or the behavior? I don't care. Sometimes I need to get you behaving a certain way before you're going to believe it. Other times you got to tap into the belief in order to drive the behaviors. One way or the other, get people behaving in alignment with a consistent and common playbook. And the behaviors are explicit and they're laid out. And then the third piece is, is something that's just for coaches, not for athletes, but just for coaches. And that is a really expanded, we call it a talking point document around each of your belief, behavior, outcomes, connections. And what that is, is that's how a coach integrates the expanded detail of everything that that belief means, every, all those behavior, the nuances, and all of the, all of the outcome nuances. In the same way that a playbook would have a one sheet that would outline the play, and then you, you, know, you flip the page in the playbook, and then there are sections that go into all of the details for how to execute that play position by position. So would the talking points be the expanded detail on all the depth of the culture about what you really mean? And it's where a coach can put his personality and drive it into there. That's number one. Number two is you have to get that playbook into each assistant coach's skill set so that the assistant coaches in what we call their small units are driving the culture from that spot. Maybe the number one problem that we see in programs, Keith, is the, the culture is too centered around the head coach. And therefore, if the head coach is not saying or doing or driving, the culture isn't really getting replicated to the extent it needs to be. And most players are going to spend far more time with their position coaches than they will with their head coaches. So you think about it. If mm -hmm. the assistant coach is only half as culturally competent, you, you're, you're missing 90% of the team. 90% right. of the team isn't getting culture the way it needs to. So the, the uh, head coach's job is to equip the assistant coaches with a culture playbook that gets them leading the culture the way they need to lead it so that the players can get it. And if, and if you look back, that's what was the game changer for Urban, right? That's what, um, that's what you look at Chris Peterson out, out at Washington. That's what we did at those two programs and, and helped those guys do as they – you know, kind of came from two different spots with two different programs and they're totally different coaches. But what, what we did with those two programs was we helped them put a better system together and then we helped them equip their staff to lead the culture so that the culture wasn't so centered on Urban Meyer, Chris Peterson. It's got to be bigger. Urban can only be in so many places. You know, you, coach, listening, you can only be in so many places. How culturally skillful is your D-line coach? How culturally aligned is your D coordinator, your O coordinator? How culturally aligned is your booster president? If you give everybody a playbook, now you have closed the gap on alignment and you've actually aligned that. So those three pieces are, are how we put a playbook together. Declare what culture is and why it's important. Take all confusion off the table. No fuzzy definitions. Identify what you believe, how you will behave, and the outcomes that are at stake. And then for yourself internally, build out a larger talking, do talking points document that shows coaches exactly how to talk about culture in meeting rooms, in film rooms, on the field, in one-on-ones with parents. Show them how to talk about culture and show them what you guys really believe so that you guys can actually discuss it and socialize it which is how culture gets built. Does that make sense? Absolutely, it does. And I think you did bring up somebody outside the, the coaching staff, somebody outside the players, in, in mentioning the boosters. And obviously, there's a lot of other stakeholders in our program. And yeah. that, that culture has to 
I believe, get to them as well. So what recommendations do you have for our coaches as they're building out their culture system? How do they get buy-in from all those other stakeholders, whether it's the administration, the boosters, alumni, other people you have to deal with, your fans, the, mm-hmm. the community, et cetera? Yeah, here's the very first thing. And well, yeah, there, there's there's a number of things. As always, we, we probably have more we have more content and more things. We that You start digging into this stuff, Keith, and, and you you, you – you try to figure out where to start and you get fired up and, and uh, <laughs> you got to kind of pick w- which thing to focus on. Let me just start with a couple things uh, and try to give you guys some real tactical things. Number one, cultures are exclusive, not inclusive, which is a dangerous phrase to say uh, right, right now. But I, I mean it this way. Cultures are exclusive, not inclusive, meaning this. If you do a culture right, if you build the right kind of culture, not everyone fits. If you build the right kind of culture, there are people who will not want to align with that kind of a culture, and that's okay. They don't have to. They don't have to. But if you're going to run a program and you're going to build a program, you have to build a culture that has clear lines. What do we do? What do we not do? What do we believe? What do we not believe? How do we behave? And how do we not behave? And once you draw those lines, then it's about who wants to be part of this program with these standards. Now, be careful what lines you draw, because once you draw the lines, you're going to have to enforce them. And one of the big mistakes is, you know, historically, um, I think especially in football, and most of us probably played for some kind of coach like this, the coach who drew the hard and fast my way or the highway line and then used it as a, as a club to just beat people over the head with it. That won't work because nobody wants to be part of that kind of program. So you got to draw lines that say, hey, here's who we are. And that leads me to my second thing. My second thing is whatever you outline the culture from a playbook perspective, our firm belief is that culture playbook needs to build the complete person, not the football person. It needs to be as relevant for a coach's behavior on and off the field as it is for a player's behavior on and off the field. It should also, in my opinion, especially at the high school level, it ought to speak, if you're doing it really well, it ought to speak to, if you're a parent in our program, it's the cultural standards that we need to abide by from a parent perspective. But outside of that, one of the things is this, and I I think every single coach listening will identify with this. The outside world, beyond players, staff, and parents, it will not reflect the values of your culture. The culture, if you draw lines and you say, this is who we are, Twitter does not support your culture. The rest of the high school does not support your culture. The people in town, Instagram, what's on TV, what they're watching on Snapchat, they don't support the culture. The culture is your program. So you have to build a culture in your program stronger, with deeper trust, with more reasons to believe in that culture than the culture in the outside world. And we deal with this with a lot of, a lot of our college clients. We're trying to build a culture in a college football program that can combat the culture on college campus and on Saturday nights and Friday nights where there are things that do not align with the standards that program has laid out that these athletes are going to encounter whether they, well, no matter what they do, they're going to encounter. So you got to build culture that supports that. Get the culture building more than just what I want you to, to do on a Friday night or on a Saturday afternoon. Get the culture building young men for life. And that's the kind of stuff that'll get a parent to buy in. And then here's the third thing. Now, now you're not asking a parent to buy in. They are begging you, how do I help? And then here's the third thing, really important for coaches on this topic and a lot of others. And it kind of goes back to the stuff that happens on a sideline. We, we have, a, we have a, a, a phrase, Urban's a really big fan of, um, so is Coach Pete. Uh, and it's gained, it gained a lot of notoriety. Now it's, it's, a, it's one of the taglines that's kind of stuck with us. And that is no BCD. BCD stands for blame, complain, defend. There are a number of things in coaching that if you coach, you're going to deal with. Do not blame other people for having to deal with them. Do not complain about having to deal with them. And do not be defensive of your behavior when you don't handle the situation well in response to things that are going to come. You know parents are going to do what parents do. That's just the reality of the job. If that's not something you're comfortable handling, I would encourage you, with love, get out of the profession. It's the job. And I I said the same thing to physicians who uh, or nurses who you know, get irritated by patients who come in. That's the job. That's the work. Teachers today, you know, really frustrated with kids' attention levels. That's the job. You are there specifically to help kids manage that attention level. The harder it gets, the better you need to be. So blaming parents, not going to work ever. So just don't. Complaining about parents, not going to work ever. Don't. And then being defensive when a parent says or does something and you respond with irritation or frustration or anger, and then that parent not dealing well with you, that's not going to work. So there should be a no BCD rule inside every program 
that no matter how hard it gets or no matter how inconvenient the circumstances, no matter how unfair what's being presented to us, there are three things we never do, starting with your head coach, your assistant coaches, and then getting down to you, the athlete. We do not blame somebody else for our decisions. We do not blame difficult circumstances. We don't complain about our environment. We do not defend our own behavior. What we do is we respond with discipline to whatever situation is put in front of us. Sometimes that discipline is patience. Sometimes that discipline is clarity. Sometimes that discipline is just listening and then saying, I appreciate hearing. I'm going to stay the course on my original plan. Your voices have been heard or whatever it is. But, but those three things are not going to work. And when you, adopt, when you adopt an OBCD policy, two things are going to happen. One, you'll be forced to find solutions. Or, number two, you'll be forced to realize none of those things are in your power anyway. And so any amount of stress you put into something that's not in your power to control is stress that could have been put into something to improve your football program. So it's either solve it and contribute or recognize it's not going away, be mentally tough and know what that needs to look like. And then, you know, we teach a bunch of skill sets around that and then simply be resilient, have the toughness and the tough skin required of this profession to say, I can't control anything about that. And so I'm going to stay my course and I'm not, I'm going to, I'm going to handle this as best as I possibly can. But, my, but if my athletes see me getting irritated and frustrated and blaming, that's going to give them a green light to do the same thing when I ask them to go run some gassers and when I ask them to do an extra set of squats, or when I ask them to drill it again because I didn't like how we just ran that play. And I don't want to give my athletes any reason to believe that we have a culture that allows those kind of behaviors. Brian, in talking about, you know, no BCDs, obviously you have to have the right response. And I feel like if, if we didn't give some time to the R factor, for yeah. you, the response, uh, we would be missing out on a big yep. thing in this interview. So talk yeah. to us. And it's something actually in reading Urban's book, I really felt compelled to share that chapter with my with my kids who are teenagers mm. to help them understand, mm. you know, the right way to deal with things when they don't like it, when they don't like, you know, the decisions their coach is making on their playing time. Obviously, things that they don't like the referee's call or something like that in a game. Talk to us about, you know, the response factor and the way to handle those responses to yeah. build better, stronger responses. Yeah. How old are your kids, by the way? 13 and 14. 13 and 14. Those are, those are fun ages. Yeah. So, yeah, you, you mentioned the R factor, which is probably our most, uh, our most popular, our most well-received and, and widely implemented system, really at, at every level of clients that we work with. It centers around a very simple equation, events plus response equals outcome. We, we simplify it even further. E plus R equals O. And, you know, you guys know how important terminology is, how important language is, and how language oftentimes precedes change. And you need to get familiar with the language so that by the time you know, everything is going 100 miles an hour on the practice field, on the game field, you have language that everybody knows. And our systems very much follow that principle. They're very language driven. They're very specific. They're very simple, but they're not easy. Simple, but not easy. And E plus R equals O is, is probably the cornerstone of that simple but not easy approach. And that is this, very, very simply. Uh, the only thing in life we have control over is how we respond. We do not control events and we do not control outcomes. Events happen whether we want them to or not, some predictable, some unpredictable. And outcomes we don't control, we create through the skill of our response. I, I have no more ability to control outcomes than you do, Keith, because I, if I controlled outcomes, I'd probably have a house in Bora Bora. Everyone would be awesome to me all the time. I would work with every program I ever wanted to work with, and you know, all my favorite teams would win championships. But I don't control outcomes. I have to earn them like everybody else. And the way I earn outcomes in my life, you know, and I'm a new dad, so you, you have a 13, 14-year-old. I, I have a, a four-month-old who I'm pretty sure I can hear me sing along to Mickey or something out there. And then I don't know what he's doing, but I earn outcomes in my life and I earn them based on not my circumstances, not the convenience, not the ease, not fate. I earn my outcomes. And I did when I played based on the quality of my response. And I look at it competitively as a player. Uh, and now, and now as a, a CEO and as a dad, uh, I look at it very similarly. But when I was a player, you know, the other team was an E for me. The, that alignment was an E. That guy I was going against was an E. And, and he was the E, and I had to respond. And the question was, whose R was going to be better? Who was going to respond with more focus, more attention, more skill, more resilience, and who's going to do it for a longer period of time? In my view, as a player, that was always the team that was going to win, was the team that not necessarily had the bigger, faster, stronger guys, but the teams that had the better responses over the course of four quarters. And we teach that skill set. We teach athletes and we teach coaches how do you build, and, and the R is broken down. There's two ways you can manage the R. You can manage your response, either discipline-driven or default-driven. Uh, you know, uh, it, it's been out there. It's been out there before. 
before, obviously, Urban's book titled Above the Line, you know, there's a line and you're going to be above it or you're going to be below it. When you're above that line, you are responding discipline driven. You're responding with intention, with purpose and with skill. If you're below that line, you're responding default driven, which is you're responding impulsively on autopilot and with resistance. Not the good kind of impulse, the unmanaged impulse, not the good kind of autopilot the undisciplined habit kind. And football, just like life, comes down to whether or not you have built into yourself the ability to respond with discipline over and over and over again. And I just think about think about your two kids. And you you talk about, you know, you went and you know the first thing you did with E plus Sparkle Zoe was was mention it and teach it to your kids, which is what all of our clients do. And it's why why we've gotten so heavy into high schools over the last eighteen months and grade schools. We actually teach it K through twelve, which is awesome. But I but I, I laugh because I say this, I say, How awesome would it be if one day your kids came down and you know, in, in three or four months and you're having breakfast and they said, Mom, Dad, come sit down at the kitchen table, I need to talk to you and they said, Based on, on the event that I'm experiencing right now, and the outcome that I'd like to create, what response on my part do you think would be the most effective and disciplined one I could engage in? <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, right? That'd be awesome. Yeah. <laughs> that'd be awesome. <laughs> that would. What if, what if, if yeah, that'd be cool. And, and it's, it's a skill set we want our kids going through in life. I believe that's why we educate young people is because our job as educators, your job as an 11th grade teacher, your job as a superintendent, your job as a football coach is to equip young people, young men to respond with discipline to the things that matter in life and to the little things that we don't always think matter, but they add up. And now from a football perspective, it's, it's a competitive advantage that nobody can touch. I mean, the team that has the ability to respond more often with discipline for longer periods of time, no matter the circumstances of the game, that team will always have an edge that is completely separate from talent or scheme or technique. Give me that skill set in a group of men, and, and, and they will go a long way, uh, if, not all, if not all the way to a championship. And what we install into programs, what we've done at Ohio State and Washington, and, and, and you know, now with you know, Coach Herman did it at, at, at Houston and obviously saw his success, and, and, and we worked with him for a number of years while he's at Ohio State, this performance pathway. And that is leaders create the culture that drives the behaviors that produce results. Leaders create culture. Culture drives behavior. Behavior produces results on and off the field. And so for coaches, just to consider, reverse engineer that. Whatever results you are looking for in your program, academically, on the field, and in building character of young men, you have to have the behavior that produces those results. The, the staff and the players have to engage in certain qualities of behavior at certain skill levels in order to produce higher, higher results. The higher the standard for the results, the higher the demand for the behavior. The behavior will never grow out of a culture that does not demand and support the behaviors you're asking for. So you can ask for strategy, you can put people in programs, you can have a, you know phenomenal technology and equipment and all kinds of stuff, but if you don't have the culture, you're not gonna get the behavior. And you won't get culture unless you lead it. Culture is not built, or doesn't, I should say, culture doesn't come from somewhere, it comes from someone. And as a coach, especially if you're a head coach, but not limited to a head coach, you are the source, you're the trigger of culture. And your job is to create a culture that drives behavior. And so that behavior reinforces the culture. And every coach has had, hopefully every coach has had the experience where you get a culture that gets moving, the player's behavior starts to align with the culture, and all of a sudden they are the, they are the ones who grow the culture, not you. You create it, but the players grow it. Now the player's behavior is not only creating culture, it's creating the, the on-the-field and off-the-field results you're looking for. So just keep that performance pathway in mind, which is the high level of everything we've talked about here today. Build leaders and use a system that drive and create and build culture. Have a system for that that drives behavior and have a system for that because that's how the results come from. And if you can tie it all together into one you know, neat, tied-in-together system, that, that's when exceptional elite levels of performance are capable. Brian, you know, one thing that it, that did occur to me uh, as we've been talking, and I had a coach on the show last week, uh, Kurt Earl um, from Oklahoma, and Kurt was talking about how the head coach really needs to be the culture coordinator, and I, I thought that was an interesting mm. perspective on it. I mean, a head coach should be doing that anyway, but when you think of, of the coordinator, now there becomes kind of a, a pecking order that you need – those position coaches underneath as well to build culture. And I think as I look at what we do, a lot of coaches leave the culture up for each of those individuals to build on their own. And sometimes they align, sometimes they're different. And I think we mistake some of that 
building culture for, you know, our own personal coaching methodology, our, our coaching philosophy mm-hmm. that each coach brings right. to the table. How important is alignment from top to bottom? And, and, you know, we're thinking of the head coach as the guy coordinating it all. It's essential man, from, a, from a championship level, mandatory. I, I would go so far as to say you cannot and you will not win a championship of any kind unless you have that kind of alignment. You can you can get by with it for a while and be pretty successful, especially if you got a lot of talent and you know the timing is right. But but in terms of real championships in the highest level, mandatory. You can't you can't get very far without it. But I will say this also for the assistant coaches listening, for the coaches who are not the head person in charge, there's nothing about culture that says you need to be in control or in charge to lead culture. You can lead culture, and in fact, you do lead culture from wherever you are. So if you as a coach are in a position where your head guy is not leading culture particularly well, do everything you can in your power to say, hey, you know, hey, whether it's us or somebody else, hey, here, pass some resources on, like, hey, here's some in culture, I think it's a good perspective. But, but if you don't get any of that, and you don't get, quote unquote, supported, or your head guy doesn't own culture, then that creates a void and a gap. And in that gap, you lead. You lead culture from where you are. Do not wait for your head coach to lead culture for you to lead culture. Now, you have to align. You got to go where your head coach is going. You got to, you can't lead culture in the opposite direction. But just because your head coach isn't leading does not mean that you can't. In fact, it's more important that you do because somebody needs to be doing it. So my, my encouragement to every assistant coach and every coordinator who's not the one necessarily setting all of this stuff and owning it from a control perspective is this, regardless of what your head coach is doing, be elite where you are. And in the absence of leadership, lead. In the absence of culture creation, pick it up and own it yourself. Figure out what he wants to get done and go make that happen and pick it up and do it. Do that, and not only will you help your program there, but you'll be building skills into yourself for when you are one day a head coach that you don't have to wait until you're a head coach to build. Brian, I know you've made all of this accessible to uh, the high school coach with uh, some of the new things you put together. I want to give you some time to, to make sure that uh, you can share those resources and where we could find those. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, the first thing is um, you can find me on Twitter, uh, Instagram, Snapchat as well, uh, at, at T. Brian Kite. So again, Twitter, Snapchat, Instagram on those. Uh, t- Twitter is probably our heaviest, but Instagram we're going much heavier on and trying to bring more resources. I uh, really appreciate the information you shared today, and you know maybe we could get you back on the on the podcast in the future as well. Yeah, I would I would appreciate that, and maybe we'll uh, maybe we'll see if we can get uh, get TK on as well. That'd be great. Thanks again. Thank you. Be sure to check out Brian's new website, DailyDiscipline.com. I highly recommend signing up for his newsletter. There's great information delivered every morning to your inbox. You can read it in just a few minutes, and I think it makes a difference in your day. Follow all we're doing on coachingcoordinator.com and follow me on Twitter at Coach K Grabowski.